You having a good day? Yeah. yeah. Guys, <laughs> some wild things happened this afternoon. Many, many wild things. That was awesome. Open up your Bible to the book of Acts, all right? So we're New Testament. If you found Corinthians this morning, go back just a little bit. We're in Acts 6 through 7. We're talking about the life of Stephen, all right? Stephen is one of my favorite characters in the entire Bible. And the reason I'm like, you know, normally when we, when we come together and we, we do church together, we talk about Jesus. And what's so cool about this retreat, I think, is because you're like in this series talking about Jesus, right? Each week you're kind of like looking at Jesus and you're talking about him. Like, what is Jesus like? What does it mean to follow him? And what I want to do is just come and say, hey, like, there are people who have kind of had an encounter with God and Christ before and they just decided to kind of say yes to that and look what happened in their lives, look who they became, look what God did through them. And I wanted that to just end tonight by looking at a dude who is literally as normal as anyone in this room, all right? Like Stephen is not like the father of the faith, like Abraham, he's not even like Paul, like an apostle. He's literally just a normal dude who decided to kind of like leverage everything he had and kind of just focus his life towards the things of God. And I think his life is amazing. He's the first Christian martyr in the Bible. The first person who was a follower of Jesus, who was actually so faithful to God that he was actually killed for his faith. And he was a man consumed with the Holy Spirit in his life and in his death. And I want to tell you about him tonight. So Acts 6, 8 says this, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Okay, just stop. Context for this, okay? Stephen is, this is in Acts 6. So this is after Jesus has died on a cross, risen from the grave. And actually the book of Acts starts in this really interesting way, right? Because it starts with Jesus, risen Christ, alive with his people. And then they're like, oh my gosh, Jesus, you rose from the grave. This is amazing. And then Jesus is like, see ya. And he leaves and goes up to heaven. And you're like, what the heck? Like the main character, the entire story just left the story. And you're like, what the heck is this whole story about? But the story of Acts is about Jesus Christ. Every page is about him, but it's about his life manifesting itself in the world through his people. And Stephen is one of those people who came to know Jesus after he leaves as the apostles are preaching. And this is the story of his life. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, And the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And when they secretly instigated men who said, well, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and they seized him and they brought him before the council and they set up these false witnesses who said, this man never ceased to speak words against this holy place and the law, for we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, are these things so? What's happening in this moment is that Jesus had this false trial that happened to him, right? And now, now Stephen is reliving this moment, right? The same people who had a false trial for Jesus are now doing the same thing for Stephen. And they, they accuse him of blaspheming God, Moses, the law, and the temple. And after each of these, these false witnesses come back and kind of give this report, they look back at Stephen for a response. They're like, what are you going to say for yourself? And it says that his face was shining like the face of an angel, Right, those beings who kind of stand in the presence of God. And as they look back at Stephen, his, his face is shining with the light of the presence of God. And it's like literally this moment, it's like, hey, you are talking, you're saying you're blaspheming, that I'm doing all this like messed up stuff against the law and Moses and the temple. But actually in this moment, it's like what is evidencing itself from Stephen's face is like, no, I'm actually not blaspheming these things and rejecting these old things. I'm just experiencing the fulfillment of all of these things. And so the high priest asks him, are these things you've said true? Are things about you true? And what Stephen does at this moment is amazing. 
Okay, he's filled with the power of the Spirit, and he's memorized so much of Jesus' story, and he's memorized so much of the whole story of the Bible, and so he just starts preaching. It's awesome. And his sermon in this passage, I'll, I'll tell you what, it, it is unbelievable. Like, it's incredible, and we don't even have time to get into it, because it's literally like two chapters long. It takes forever. Like, we would be here for 30 minutes. We read the entire thing. But I'm serious. It is incredible. It's complex. It's profound and genius. And the first few times I read this when I was a young Christian, I just read it, and I was like, this is super confusing. I don't get what's going on. But now that I've read it enough times, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is happening in this moment is amazing. It's this incredible sermon, and it isn't him. It's the Spirit of God doing what Jesus said it would do in Luke 12. It says, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And so what the Spirit of God does through Stephen is he takes each of these accusations they've brought against God's servant, and he actually turns it back into an accusation against them. And he does it subtly and he does it gracefully, pulling them further and further into the story he's telling because he's telling them their story, right? These are the Jewish leaders. These are kind of the Israelite high elites who they loved the law of God, but they hated Jesus. And so he's kind of pulling them in, telling them their story while together he's weaving together one of the strongest rebukes we have in the entire story of the Bible. And so he starts by telling the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then he ends with how all the rest of God's people, right, took and sold their brother Joseph into slavery. And he's like, yeah, remember the one, that story in your history that you kind of tie yourselves to? Remember how the one that God sent to save them, your fathers actually abandoned him to die? And he's like, remember Moses, like the other guy that like led you out of slavery? And they're like, yeah, Moses, that guy, like he's our man. And he's like, yeah, remember how your fathers rejected him and didn't follow his leadership either? And he's like, remember the law, that wonderful thing you cherish so much? And they're like, yes, the law. And he's like, remember how the first thing you did when God was writing it was you chose to worship two golden calves instead? And remember how the whole story of Israel is basically your father's choosing to worship other gods instead of Jesus? And you know the temple, right? The temple you revere so much that the temple that couldn't be built because of David's sin. Remember the last chapter of Isaiah that God is way bigger than your small temple you're trying to rebuild and the thing that actually demands of you isn't your sacrifices but is your humility that you would be people who would tremble before his word and repent. And like he's weaving this really complex story together and real quick, should I go this closer? Further away. What should I do? Closer? Right here? Guys, is less feedback? All right, great. I'm going to hold it right here. I'm not going to move it. I could hear that too. I just, I didn't know if they were trying to EQ it out or something. Okay. So then it gets to verse 51, okay? And in verse 51, you can go there in your Bible. I'm just kind of, I skipped a bunch. Everything comes to a head, okay? Because he's preaching this sermon. Everything comes to a head. And what he does is he like takes this thread he's been weaving and he pulls it all the way through the whole history and ties it to a crescendo. And he's standing before the most powerful people in his world at this time. And this is what Stephen says. Are you ready for this? It is epic, okay? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced the coming of the righteous one whom you now have betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And then verse 54 says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Now, I'm going to be really honest. I have no idea what that means, okay? Like, I don't know what it looks like to grind your teeth at someone. I don't know if that's, like, literal or metaphoric. All I know is, like, it wasn't good. They're very, very angry, okay? What Stephen does is he takes the knife of God's word, and he takes it, and he drives it through their present to the very back of their entire history. And he says, no, actually, you who've rejected Jesus, you're not doing God's will but you stubbornly refuse God's leading. You're not those marked out by God through his covenant because you're actually uncircumcised in your heart and your ears, and your fathers are not spiritual giants, but they actually killed the prophets that God sent to them, and they killed them because they were talking about the righteous one that was to come, the righteous one that's now been betrayed and murdered by you. That's a sermon. And you have to understand this is the most scathing rebuke that these people could receive, right? It's kind of like intellectual for us. It's a little bit like above our pay grade. We're reading it. We're like, I wish I knew more of the Bible because that would make more sense to me. They got it. They understood every word. This was a sermon for these religious elites of the day. 
And Stephen aligns himself with them, right? He's like our fathers. He's like, this is what we've done. I'm including myself in this. This is my story too. He doesn't present himself as better than them, but make no mistake, he brings down the hammer. One thing before we move on. This isn't the main point, but listen. Don't soften the gospel because you think it will help people accept it. Don't do that. You see, when you soften the gospel, you actually don't make it more palatable, but what you end up doing is actually stripping it of its power. Because the message of Jesus is, it is that every human being stands condemned, full of sin and rebellion, with the wrath of God and the justice of God marking out their story. And we don't help the message of Jesus by minimizing that or not talking about that. You see, the power of the gospel message is actually that while that was true of us, that while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies in rebellion against him, that is the moment when he died for us. And that's actually how the message of the gospel has power because that is where the love of God is displayed. And so Stephen brings the hammer down. He preaches one of the most intense and scathing sermons that we read in the entire New Testament, and they are mad. But this isn't what gets him killed. What gets him killed is what happens next, okay? Keep reading verse 54. Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Because just for a moment, just pause, think about this. He's telling them what's true of them. And in this moment, he has this, he has a vision. He's full of the Holy Spirit and he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he cries out and he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. They like cover their ears at this and they rush after him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is how Stephen's story ends. Verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. All right, listen, this man and this story, I'm telling you, it deserves your full attention tonight. Like, it deserves all of you. Like, if you're tired and you're like, I played hard today, I'm tired. Like, rally your soul, okay? Because this story deserves your full attention. Not because this man was great in himself, but because this man was filled with the Spirit of God. Stephen is one of the first deacons in the early church, okay? Now, what is a deacon? Deacon is basically just like, they, they went back and they kind of looked and they said, man, who are these people who can like help serve the church? Stephen is one of these men and he's a man of such tremendous spiritual power and unstoppable force against the enemies of God that the only thing they can do to stop him is kill him. And they do. And what's incredible about Stephen's story and so many Christians who followed after him in his footsteps is that he doesn't fight for his life. He doesn't actually try to overpower those who are killing him, but with his eyes set to heaven, staring into the face of Jesus, he uses his last breath not to curse them, but to pray for them, to forgive them. And after the last and heaviest stones do their work, and the blood of Jesus through the blood of Stephen begins to soak into the ground. His last words ring in the ears of those who stand around his shattered body. Like those last words, right? Like you just picture yourself in the crowd. You've got this stone and you like heave it on this dude and as you're about to drop it on him, the very last thing he does is pray for you that you would receive blessing and grace in your life and then boom, 
the last stone goes down. And that words of this man are ringing in the ears of everyone. And everyone who's standing around this man is asking themselves in that moment, who is this man with his eyes set to heaven, unmoved and unshakable? We brought everything we could to get this dude to stop doing this, and he's unshakable. Who is this man so fearless and bold in the face of such strength and horror? Who is this man who uses his last dying breath to speak blessing over his murderers? The answer is that he is a Christian. But he is a Christian who is filled with the Spirit of God, a man absolutely consumed by the things of God. And as this great saint of God, as his blood is spilled on the front lines of God's war against sin and death, what first seems like a victory for the enemies of God is very quickly seen to be a tremendous mistake. Because as the blood of this mighty man of God seeps into the ground, the gates of hell begin to rattle. And it is like a wind goes thweep, sweeps through the enemy's camp because with the last breath of this dying man, he has prayed. And the one who is standing at the right hand of the throne of God has heard his prayer. And from the moment that Stephen's blood is spilled, the story of Acts is going to take this crazy turn, actually, because persecution is actually going to increase. But as persecution increases, the gospel begins to spread. And we're introduced into this new character in the story in this part of Acts, a man named Saul, right? The one who they lay their robes down at the feet of this guy, saying, you're in charge of this. We give you glory and honor because you're powerful enough to destroy this dude but he's also the one that Stephen has prayed for. And God will change him from the greatest opponent of Christianity to the greatest missionary that the world has ever seen. And God answers the prayer of Stephen by forgiving and saving the very man who spilled his blood. And instead of crushing the movement of God, he will meet Jesus and he will be the one that Jesus will use to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. That's the Apostle Paul. And as we come to this part of the story of the Bible, we need to ask ourselves some questions. We've been asking ourselves about, like, what is our calling, right? Like, what is the calling on your life as a Christian? We've been talking about ambition, right? And ambition is, like, part of this story, too, right? It's like what drives you, what controls you, right? We've been talking about what are you living for, but Stephen's life is actually kind of begging this other question. It's like, man, is, is the thing you're living for also worth dying for? But I want to ask another question, maybe more pointed, it's just this. Does the ambition of your life and your spiritual power make the enemies of God hate and fear you? Or are you spiritually threatening to the enemies of God, or spiritually unthreatening? Like, is the ambition of your life, your focus, like the way you're cultivating spiritual power through the Spirit, like, is that something that makes the enemies of God hate and fear you, know you by name, or are you someone who is spiritually unthreatening to them? I want to talk about Stephen's life and his death. I'm just floored by the life of this guy. I remember reading this story a couple years ago for like the, you know, 20th time or something, but something like hit me about it in this powerful way, and I've been trying to become more like this guy since because he has a spirit-filled life. That's what it says about him. He's filled with the spirit. And so one of the very first things we see is that a spirit-filled life is a life of service. Actually, earlier in the story, we're introduced to Stephen in 6.5. We don't have time to read this, but basically they're going around and the apostles are like kind of, they're preaching and teaching. They have this kind of like staff role with the church, right? And there's, they're trying to figure out, man, we got these like tables that like we're trying to do this like food line to help people who are impoverished and need food to help feed the church. And they're trying to figure out how do we like do our jobs here and do the food line. So what they do is they say, we're going to raise up these servants called deacons. We're going to find some of these people, qualified men to come and just do this thing and like serve these tables. We're going to figure out how to do this. And so they go and they find this group of people. And we're told that one of the men they find is this guy named Stephen. And it says that he is a man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. And his job as a deacon, his job in the church, his role was to oversee the food distribution line. That's what he did. That was his role on staff. Verse 8 says this. Okay? And Stephen, this dude who oversees the food line, was full of grace and power. And he was doing great wonders and signs among the people. 
And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen and the Cyrenians, Alexandrians from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and dispute with Stephen, okay? So there's these like kind of great academic circles of learning and philosophy that have this like anti-Jesus message. And so they're like, hey, we're going to like, this guy Stephen is like preaching and he's got this kind of ministry in town and he's like saying this about Jesus. So we're going to dispute with him and argue with him. And it says this, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. One of the things we need to see from this and one of the things that every one of you needs to hear, like really needs to hear and understand from this story is, listen, your position and your role in the church doesn't really matter at all. It matters zero what position you have in the church. What matters is whether you are someone who's filled with the Spirit of God or not. What's his role? Like, what's this dude's job? Well, his job is to help oversee the food distribution, all right? Like, think about that. It's a service-oriented role. He's the guy who comes in early in the morning and sets up the tent and the sound equipment. Like, he's the guy who's responsible for making sure that the right number of chairs are in the room. Now, he has responsibility, and he, he has an important role, keeping the church on track, keeping it working. But he isn't one of the apostles. He isn't even, like, the leader of this thing. He isn't even one of the elders. He is the guy who oversees the food line. And yet, this is a man who is absolutely consumed with the things of God. And everyone knew it. And so in verse 8, it just says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Listen, I don't know about you, but I freaking love that. Like, I love this. It's one of my favorite parts in the whole story of the Bible. Because listen, if you're like following the story of Acts at this point, like the religious leaders, they're trying to squash this movement. They don't want this to succeed. And so you're trying to lock up the apostles and throw them in prison because you think, man, you think the power is like flowing from the leaders. And if you can lock them up, then the movement's going to be over. Get the leaders. But then you turn around and there's a bunch of your priests, like your A team, like your varsity, like they're being converted to Christianity. And there's this whole murmur going through the town of signs and wonders this guy's performing. And you find out that the guy who's causing all this commotion is the soup kitchen guy. Like, that's the dude. And you think about this from the perspective of the religious leaders. Honestly, it's amazing. It's kind of hilarious. The warrior who is like slashing and gutting your ranks, cutting you out from the inside of your organization. Who is at the front of this movement? Who is the tip of the spear that's moving forward with courage and power and signs and wonders? It is essentially the lunch lady. It is. And some of you are like, I remember my lunch lady. <laughs> she was my favorite person at school, right? <laughs> or my least favorite person at school. But I'm serious, that should do a couple things. And it really should. First, it means that Christians, and you specifically, should not get swept up into the world's idea that the only positions of influence and power and value are positions of authority. They're just not. One of the most influential and powerful people in the early church was the man serving the soup. He wasn't busy climbing to the top of the organization. He was actually busy climbing to the bottom. He wasn't trying to get a seat at the head of the table, but he was waking up early to help fix the food so he could serve everyone at the table. That's who Stephen was. And listen, this is not a lesser role in the kingdom of God. But Stephen is doing exactly what Jesus told him to do if he wanted to be great in his kingdom. He says, if you want to be great, then be the servant of all. And listen, we shouldn't be stunned when someone who does what Jesus says receives what Jesus promised. And Stephen simply just did what Jesus told him to do if he wanted to be great, and Jesus made him great. He's a normal dude whose story has been put in this book for every single Christian to read for all the rest of time. And he says, you want to be great? Then be the servant of all. And so Stephen hears this story, probably told from the apostles about Jesus, and so he just begins climbing down underneath everyone else, and he serves the table, and he becomes the first Christian who's so spiritually dangerous to God's enemies that the only course of action they have is to kill him. 
He's so spiritually powerful. It's the only way they can deal with him. Listen, your role and your position in the kingdom isn't what's important. Some of you, you're in this room and you just think, oh man, like I, I want to make an impact. I love this. If I could just get one of those salt residencies, like if I could just get that, then I'd really be able to like impact people and have influence and my life would matter. No, what's important is whether you are someone who's filled with the spirit of God or not. And you don't need to change a single one of your circumstances to become that person. The second thing it should do, it just should give us a crazy vision for our lives, all right? The tip of the spear, the one who is doing the signs and wonders, the one that they couldn't withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking, listen, he isn't an apostle He's, he's not an apostle. He is just a normal Christian man. So what makes him so powerful? And what's interesting is it tells us, it says that he was a man filled with faith and filled with the Spirit of God. Now, that should actually stop us for a moment, right? Because we should be like, well, wait a minute. Like, why are these the things that are being singled out, right? Because don't all Christians have faith? Yeah, they do. We do. Every Christian, you have faith. Well, don't all Christians actually have the, the Holy Spirit? Yes, all Christians have the Holy Spirit. But, but there's something markedly different about Stephen and the people around him. He's different. And everyone around him knows it, and even the enemies of God, they know it. You see, when you become a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And what God does is he puts his Holy Spirit in you. That is true of every single person who is in Christ. But how much you live your life according to that new spirit that's put in you, you actually have some ability to affect the answer to that question. And this isn't some kind of Christianity 2.0 or some kind of like hidden knowledge, you know. It's like, no, but it's just like the flame of the spirit of God that Jesus puts inside of you. You can either fan it into flame with the way you live your life and the things you focus on and the way you spend your time, or you can effectively dump water on it. And every moment of our lives, we're doing one of those two things. We're dumping water on it or we're fanning it into flame. Which one do you spend more time doing? I know for myself, I'm telling you guys, like I spend way more time dumping water on it. Way more time. Like I look at my last even two weeks and I'm like, gosh, like I can't get those two weeks back and I wasted so much time. Like I found these funny YouTube videos and I just was watching them and it was literally like not that, it wasn't that weird, it wasn't that wrong. It just was like, gosh, dang it. Like I had two weeks of my life. I had hours of time that I could have been fanning into flame the spirit of God, becoming a more spiritually powerful person. And instead I just kind of like slowly sprinkled water on that flame and I kind of saw it like sizzle out just a tiny bit. And I'm not like trying to bring any like harshness on you guys or whatever. I'm just saying this is the reality of our lives. Like, this is true. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says this. It says, man, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. He says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Philippians 3.12 says this, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, meaning like I have not like received the full final thing that Jesus is trying to give me, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has already made me his own. He says, brothers, sisters, I don't consider I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature Think like this. Here's what the Bible would say. Here's what the whole of the New Testament is saying. God doesn't make some Christians into lions and others into lambs. That's not what he does. 
No, he actually gives some of us, he doesn't give some of us like a portion of his spirit of power and then others a portion of his spirit of like weakness and fear. No, he actually puts inside of all of us the spirit of his son, Jesus. And he puts inside of you actually the power of God. Like literally when you become a Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus joins himself to you, God puts his spirit in inside your body the spirit of god that endlessly rails against all that is evil and unjust and horrible in the world the spirit of god that endlessly rails against the gates of hell with the unstoppable fury of the almighty that is inside you that's inside your body that's inside you that is now defining you and i think that maybe the difference between stephen and most of us, is I think he just took that seriously. I think he heard about what happened at Pentecost, and he was like, dude, I want that. He probably got some of the, rid of the distractions in his life. You know, he probably just started doing some of the things that we all know we should do. We just feel like they're not maybe important enough to spend our time doing. He probably just started praying, like, a lot more. Like all the time. Like he was like, pray without ceasing. Mm, First Thessalonians 5. I'm going to actually try to do that. I'm just going to try to like pray and not stop praying through my entire day. He probably started reading and memorizing large chunks of the Old Testament. And, and that was all the Bible that was written down at that point, right? And he probably started to like hear the, the stories of Jesus that the apostles were telling him. He started to memorize these stories. And he's like, man, I don't have words. Like I don't know what to say. I'm not eloquent. I'm not charismatic. I don't know what to say. But, but God, you have words. And so maybe if I memorize these and just get these into me, like maybe God will use these words for for power and to do something, and he probably started taking his sin deadly serious. Like he stopped toying around with it, and he was just like, no, I'm going to like seriously fight for holiness because he knew that actually sin, willful sin, it quenches the Spirit of God in us. And he probably started to actually fight his sin with every single fiber of his being. He's like, I want to get this out of my life so I can be this holy vessel for the Spirit of God to use as power. And he probably started actually obeying God when he heard his voice. Like that still, small voice of God when you just hear it and he's like, hey, go do this. Talk to this person. Do this thing. He probably stopped like procrastinating and pushing that out and he probably just started being like, yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. He just started to listen to God and obey him. And when God told him to do something, he just did it. And he didn't wait until it makes sense to him. He just did it right away. Why? Well, I think it's because Stephen, he just wasn't content to take a back seat in this war. He's like, I know my king. I know Jesus. I know he's at war with all that is wrong and evil and unjust in the world. And I don't want to sit on the sidelines or be in the back ranks of that. I want to be on the front lines because that's where Jesus is. And he knew that if he was going to be in the front lines of this battle against sin and death, he knew he needed power because he didn't have what it takes. And so he trained himself to become the person that Jesus bled and died for him to be. A man of immense spiritual power. And it was a power that wasn't his. He didn't cultivate it. He didn't create it or earn it. But he oriented all of his life to be filled with it. What would it look like if the next year of your life, you did that? You just said more than anything in the world, I want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to pursue that with every fiber of my being. Maybe another question is like, do you want this power? Like, do you, do you want to be on the front lines of God's war against sin and death? Do you want to be at the tip of the spear? Stephen did. And he was. And because the spirit that was inside of him was the spirit of God, and because he was filled with that spirit, when he walked forth into the world, 
he walked with a wisdom and a power that the world could not contend with. Spurgeon has this quote. I love it. It's pretty long, but it is amazing. And this is, he's talking about this, this story. And he says this, he says, now my brethren, and whenever a quote starts with brethren, you're like, oh, hold on. All right. Now, my brethren, if you and I desire to walk among the sons of men without pride, but yet with a bearing that is worthy of our calling and adoption as the princes and princesses of the blood royal of heaven, we must be trained by the Holy Spirit. Those men who are cowardly, whose profession of religion is so timid that you scarcely know whether they've made it or not, those men who go cap in hand into the world asking leave to let live, they know nothing of the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit dwells inside a human, they know the right and they hold the right, and they are not the servant of men, humblest among the humble in all things else. But when it comes to a matter of conscience, he owns no master but his master who is in heaven, no child of God. Listen to this. No child of God need fear the face of the great, for they are greater than the world. You see, God has put within them a spirit of uprightness and sternness for the right, which the world cannot bend, let its blast howl as they will. I pray to God that we may learn the manliness of Christianity, for much injury has been done to the face by those adopting another mode or procedure by fawning and cringing before those they view as mighty. But that upward glance of Stephen seems to say to us, eyes up, Christian, eyes up. Let your heart go up to heaven. Let the desires mount. Let the whole soul fly towards heaven. And with heaven in our eye, we may walk through the crowds of men as a lion walks through a flock of sheep. And our fellow men will involuntarily own our power. An all-consuming passion for the name of Jesus. Listen, this is what consumed Stephen's life. Whether he was waiting tables or he was ladling food out for hungry people or whether he was standing before the most powerful authorities of the land proclaiming the gospel, what was consuming him was this all-consuming passion that had everything else in his life orient around it. Stephen was a man filled with the Spirit of God. He's filled with the Spirit of God. That was his power. And listen, the Spirit of God is not content with any other kind of power for you, any smaller ambition than this. The Spirit of God is not content. It's not, it just feels restless. It feels restless if it's dwelling inside weak-willed, apathetic, sidelined Christians. But the Spirit of God intends to make lambs into lions. He wants to make weak people into ironclad, unshakable, courageous warriors. Listen to me. Like... You can have that life. Like, you can have that passion. You can have that power because the power that Stephen had is actually the power that's being offered to you. He doesn't want to give you a portion of his spirit. He wants to give it to you in full. He wants to give it to you in power. He wants to make you into someone whose very voice shakes the ground around them. He wants to make you into someone who's so spiritually powerful that the demons know you by name and are afraid of you. He wants to make you into someone who's filled with so much wisdom and knowledge and power that the enemies of God can't contend with you. They'd be so unable to contend with you that the only course of action they would have to shut you down as you go spreading the gospel into this dark world would be to kill you. And listen, he wants to make you into someone who is so spiritually powerful that when the world would come, to take everything from you, you would be so strong that you would let them. Because the power that Jesus is extending to you is not the power to conquer over the enemies of God through brute force or political or social influence, but it's the power to lay down your life for those around you just like Jesus laid down his life for you. The power that he's talking about is actually the power to be able to see and hear the words of Jesus spoken over you more loudly and clearly than the people of the world who are condemning you. 
You see, it's not the power to lift the stones and actually conquer God's enemies, but it's the power that while being crushed by them, you might use your last dying breath to actually forgive them and pray for their grace and salvation. Listen, that is power. That is power. And there's nothing more powerful that someone could witness than that. You see, Stephen was a man who was doing signs and wonders among the people, but the greatest miracle and the greatest evidence of his spiritual power, it actually came in the moment of his death. When he was able to set his eyes above the throngs of people hurling stones at him and stare into the face of his Savior in heaven. And in seeing Jesus and being captivated by him and enthralled by him, that he'd be able to look back down into the eyes of all of those who were hurling stones and insults at them, and he'd be able to actually love them and pray for their blessing and pray for grace and pray for God to forgive them as they drop the final boulders onto his shattered body. And listen, that was the scene that Paul saw when people came and were laying robes down at his feet. They were honoring him for his ability to conquer But soon Paul would realize that the man who was crushed beneath his feet was the man with real power. That as Stephen's blood was seeping into the ground, that he was the one who had actually truly conquered. Listen, Stephen's death is not a tragedy. It is a victory. It's like a tremendous victory in the story of the Bible. And actually, like the story of the church, it literally takes off from this moment with Stephen. Because in the next chapters of the story, the man who's standing over Stephen's execution would meet Jesus. God would change him. And he'd go from being the greatest opponent of the church to the greatest missionary that the world has ever known. And his whole life would be shaped by this moment. Like if you read the New Testament and you read Paul's letters, like he never talks about Stephen specifically. But Stephen's life is imprinted onto every one of the pages of Paul's letters. He views the entire story of Christianity through this lens. He literally has this scene of this human being who wasn't Jesus but looked almost exactly like him, dying and praying for him, imprinted onto his mind. And literally it shaped every single moment of the Apostle Paul's life. Is what you're living for worth dying for? This is what Spurgeon says. He says, I believe that every genuine Christian heart that loves the Savior feels just like that. Like the dying soldier in the hour of battle who's cheered with the thought, the general is safe, the victory is ours, my blood is well spent. My life well lost to win the victory. Let Christ reign, and I will make no bargain as to myself. Let Jesus be king the whole world over. I care for nothing else. Let him wear the crown. Let the pleasure of the Lord prosper in his hands. Let his covenant purposes be fulfilled. Let his elect be saved. Let the kingdoms of his world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Why? What does it matter if even 10,000 of us should go pining through the valley of the shadow of death? Our lives and deaths were all well spent to receive such a great reward as to see Jesus glorified. I don't know what you want for your life, but that's what I want for mine. I want to see Jesus glorified more than anything in the world. And I'm such a distracted Christian. Like, I've got so much sin. Like, if I unrolled my life before you, it'd be so, I'd be so ashamed of the way I live my life. But, like, in my heart of hearts, like, the deepest, truest me, like, I love Jesus. And I want to fall in with everything I have. He's given me meaning and purpose to my life. He's given me something that's actually worth living for, and literally it's worth dying for. And if you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, man, you got to know him. He's calling your name. He loves you. He's trying to give you something, not just to save you, but to live for that will give you meaning and purpose and hope and a life that's actually worth living. Do you know Jesus? And if you know him, are you living for him? 
Have you oriented your whole life around him? Are you this kind of person that's like, man, I've put Jesus in the corner of my life, and I love that he's here, but I've got this whole host of other stuff I'm really concerned about and living for, and I'm telling you, that life is not worth dying for. But to live your entire life for the glory of Jesus, to see him high and lifted up with every moment, with every fiber of your being, if that's the thing that you want to live for, I'm telling you, that is not a life that's just worth living for. That is a life that's worth dying for. That is an ambition worth leveraging everything for, giving all your freedoms up. And I'm telling you, that is the calling on your life if you're a Christian. And if you're going to be that person, you're going to need power like, you're going to need power because you can't accomplish this. We're fighting an enemy that is so much stronger and smarter than we are. Like, I don't know if you figured it out, but, like, your grades don't really help the kingdom of God that much. They don't. But being a spiritually powerful person does. Being someone who knows the Bible does. Being a man or a woman of prayer does. Being someone who's gotten rid of like so much of the sin that so easily clings to us, that does. And when you pursue that life, the Spirit of God actually starts to fill you. And you become someone spiritually powerful. And you become someone that when you walk out into the world, it's not just you that's walking out there. But it's Jesus himself filling your body because he's alive, and he's in you, and he doesn't want a normal life for you. He doesn't want a normal Christian life for you. Let me pray. Jesus, You didn't go after the elites. You didn't go after the people that knew their Bible super well and were super spiritual and awesome and just like these amazing examples of men and women. You went after just some fishermen, super normal people. And Jesus, we're just like them. We don't really have anything in our hands to offer you except our sin and our distractedness. And But Jesus, you take people like that and you change the world with them if they would let you. And that's what you did 2,000 years ago. It's what you've been doing ever since. And Jesus, I for one, I don't want to live a normal life. I feel like I have a calling on me that is glorious and amazing. I want to press into that. God, I don't want to live for my freedoms. I don't want to just like fight to just like skate through this life and eventually get to heaven, but I want to be ambitious for you because you were ambitious for me. And Jesus, we want to be people filled with power. God, we're so tired of seeing this world so lost and broken, and we know that the only way it's going to be changed is if your power does it. And so Jesus, I just pray that you would make this room of people, people who are filled with power that your spirit would be alive in us, that we'd be filled with it, God, that we'd fight our sin, we'd hate our sin, we'd get rid of it, and the sin that clings so closely, Jesus, just help us get rid of that in our lives and pursue you so that you would actually fill us with your spirit so we could go out into the world and make a difference because that's what you've called us to do. In your name, amen.